Hi, this is Ashley Farode and you're listening to Behind the Bio, the podcast about the people behind the professions. In this specific episode, Dr. Matthew Trinka is going to be my guest. He is the director of the National Museum of Australia. Now, Matt and I talk about all things NMA, but we also talk about the greater scope of what museums mean to society, to our nation, to the community, and ultimately to himself. We also delve into Matt's career and figure out what kind of skills he had to balance in order to be successful at the job that he currently has. If you're interested in the world of museums, galleries, or the cultural sector altogether, or what it takes to have a job at that level of a major national institution, then most certainly this is the podcast for you. I'd like to thank the Coordinate Group in Canberra for making this possible, and I hope you enjoy this conversation with Dr. Matthew Trinka from the National Museum of Australia on Behind the Bio. Matthew, thank you so much for making the time this morning. No, it's a pleasure. <laughs> um, I did a home story recently, and the conversation we had during that home story, uh, I found very, very interesting so much so that I wish I was recording it at the time. Because even though we were talking about your home, we went into much deeper territory. We talked about your background, your love of history, how you ended up working, where you are. And then we started talking about the importance of art and history and all cultural things to the nation. You know, So we got really deep, I should say, over a couple of biscuits and a coffee. I know, it just shows you, doesn't it? When you um, take time to sit down and have a coffee with someone and uh, and you start to ruminate on the things that matter to you, you know, the territory you can go into, I yeah, suppose. So unfortunately, I did not have... Have the microphone on me so I said hey what how about we catch up and, and chat so here we are yeah. on, a, on a Wednesday um, obviously I've managed to kind of pull you out of a very busy schedule so thank you for that no it's a pleasure as I said I did want to talk about you as an individual because during that conversation that we had at your home uh, I realized that at heart you're an academic um, I mean I should have probably known that but is that true to know. say it's, that it's so interesting to hear you say that because I don't think of myself uh, in those terms I mean I've been fortunate enough to have had the experience of uh, of studying history, particularly you know at university, both uh, in a bachelor's degree and arts degree that I did in um, Western Australia at the University of Western Australia, and then a PhD that I uh, that I finished at Sydney University, uh, and I there was a time when I thought that I was bound for an academic career, but I then. Um, accidentally really fell into museums and realised that was um, much more my natural home, that the mix of ideas in museums but also a breadth of opportunity with audiences of all different kinds was more naturally the space that appealed to me. And so I've been very devoted to the practice of ideas. I really love ideas and I think about those issues a lot in the course of the work that we do here at the National Museum of Australia. Mm. But yeah, I don't think of myself as an academic. (laughs) Well, the only reason I say there's two two influences in my life. First of all, my dad is an academic, he's a political scientist. And the way that he looks at issues of the world, and even in his home, is of academic nature. He takes information, digests it, look at history, the past, makes projections of the future, a very academic way of looking at things. The other side of it is I worked at the National Gallery of Australia for, for quite a few years and realised that when I moved from the education sector, or tertiary education sector, to the gallery sector, in fact, the conversation around particular topics was very similar. There were people who had a lot of knowledge, deep knowledge about particular things in art, which I actually found very academic in the way that they discussed it and so forth, even though ultimately the end goal of both the NGA and you know, university are quite different. Oh, actually, you could say they both educate, maybe. Yes, you could yeah, say that. Yeah, you can there say that about this place. So, too, yeah, so place. I find that, that link really, really strong. So maybe what I meant is perhaps not so much an academic career, but that your approach to what you do in your life has to be backed by, I guess, an academic way of thinking. It's interesting you say this because one of the things that I think is um, undeniable is that people from all walks of life are searching for ideas. They're searching for the ideas that sustain them in their daily lives but also in the, the breadth that they might have, the expansion of themselves or the individual. 
And that's true of anybody, really. You know, I've had the most interesting discussions with people who've had, you know, ostensibly very little formal education. And so I think ideas uh, can be can be made, exchanged, discussed, elaborated by anybody. Mm. In fact, I, I have a very strong view that um, inclines me against sort of intellectual snobbery, really, of, <laughs> any, of any kind. Having said that, you have to listen to people properly to really hear that even though they might not have the uh, the toolkit or the accoutrements or the the language of a university education, they're actually saying things that are um, just as searching and um, potentially revealing about what human life is as someone who's been through a formal education. And that's the, the part that appeals to me. If you really listen to anybody, you come to see that they are grappling with all the essential issues of life, all the, the great questions. They may not always express them in ways that those of us have been fortunate enough to have a, you know, a, a university education, mm-hmm. or indeed, you know, other forms of higher education may be able to use, but the ideas are just as far-reaching and modern and potentially uh, they are ideas that can extend and enlarge all of us, right? and our, our sense of what it means to live on the planet, what the responsibilities are to each other that we have as human beings and what's, what, what's fundamentally the purpose of our lives, why we matter. Mm. And so, I mean, I find those subjects absorbing but I find that you can have conversations about those things with anybody if yeah. you just are prepared to talk to them about what matters to them and then go into that other territory. So that, if that's the case, I've got to put it to you that maybe what we're talking about here is that an academic approach is an approach about having a keen interest in things. And I don't mean just at a superficial level, I wonder how that happens, but really delve into things. Now, those things could be various things, history, art, like I just mentioned at the NGA, perhaps the kind of things that, that happen at universities in terms of research, right down to having an interest in what another person is saying, even though they might not be of the same background as you, mm-hmm. educational status, whatever it may be. So maybe the conversation you and I had at your home, I found kind of very <laughs> insightful because you were talking about relatively everything from, from you know, your garden right through the coffee we were having. And then we, we got quite deep about the importance of such things as museums yeah, in yeah. society. But we were able to cut through it in every way because of an actual curiosity to what it is that makes us human and how we communicate and essentially what we're trying to do together as humanity, right? So maybe what I say is, being academic, I don't necessarily mean sitting in an armchair with a lot of books behind you and studying something ferociously. It's actually about having a keen interest and applying that interest to perhaps something a bit more. Yeah, look, I, and, and actually, I'm not trying to argue with you about no, this no. as well. I, um, I, look, I think, and uh, and people, you know, you might say of, of me that, you know, that you've got a, a sensibility that emerges out of, you know, academic practice and study. You know, the, the great attraction of this place, the National Museum, has been that it's not singular in the breadth of its sort of interest. And what I mean by that is I can't think of another of the institutions in Canberra that effectively has the, the, the length and breadth of the land and everything in it and all the experiences that are, are the summation of, of um, what people have lived through uh, in this country over many thousands of years and most obviously as well this long history that uh, that has created a distinction really of this continent in global terms. I, I just think that this museum has been um, so fortunate to have this breadth of, of intellectual ambition and one of the great pleasures of being here and working here originally as a curator and then as as uh, as one of the members of the senior executive and ultimately as director has been that has been this freedom to really range over a whole uh, variety of topics in the course of my work here and the course of our work in this place you know this essential sort of collaboration that you have with all of the staff in the place that has been the delight and 
you know, this museum has, can be as interested in um, Tupperware and how it was used in domestic settings in the mm. 1950s as it might be in the life of Chifley or Menzies or other um, you know figures in the in in the, the story of nation as it is in the remarkable rock art of central australia that reaches back so many thousands of years in the beads you know found in a rock shoulder in western australia not in the collection of the national museum but in another museum collection in this country that are amongst the oldest forms of human adornment anywhere in the world mm. i mean that's an amazing tale. And sometimes I've felt that Australians haven't uh, haven't recognised how fortunate they are to live in a country with what is such a distinctive, remarkable uh, set of experiences that are animating its life. You know, our history is astonishing in global terms. And so often you hear the contrary, you know, about or arguments were made. Certainly when I was younger, people would make arguments about Australia having no history. You couldn't be further from the truth. Mm. Australia's got a remarkable story. You know, 65,000 years at least of, of human cultures living and evolving in this place. The wonder of making a, a nation in the last couple of 100 years drawing people from around the world, you know, people from Europe, from Africa, from Asia, from the Americas, all finding their home here. That's a story like nowhere else on earth, one that we should be fascinated by and proud of. Is that freedom that you speak of, that there is so many things you could cover when it comes to Australia as a whole, is that freedom also the biggest challenge? Because you think, what do we focus on yeah, now? Of when do we? It's almost like having incredible knowledge and being excited about trying to you know, bestow that knowledge on someone, but then not, not knowing, okay, which, which bits go first? Because you could overwhelm people, you could lose them along the way. But is that almost the hardest part of that balance? The beautiful freedom that you've gotten, the excitement of all the things that we could speak about versus, okay, how do we, how do we put this into digestible chunks that our audiences ultimately are going to enjoy and be educated by and share in? Is that kind of the hardest Yeah, look, part? I think that's true. It has yeah. been the great challenge for the for the National Museum of Australia. I'd like three times as much space yeah. to show the collection <laughs> and the range across these topics, really. The nation deserves it, you know. Yeah. Our story is big. And in a sense, um, we have sometimes felt that the, the, the space in this remarkable building that's home to the National Museum is inadequate to the task of trying to tell this varied story of nation. And so in, in so many ways, you know, you've, you've hit the nail on the head with this, you know, you've gone right to the heart of the matter. How do we represent the nation and the, and the breadth of its, its experiences in what is finite space of the National Museum? I mean, the good thing is, of course, online now we can, yeah. we can expand and breathe and cover this breadth and some of the things we've done for schools recently particularly uh, the program that has developed Australia's Defining Moments Digital Classroom funded by Gandalf Philanthropy, that is astonishing in its breadth and the resources now available for Australian school kids at primary and secondary years to really range across all these topics. But, you know, someone said to me, a very wise man actually said to me many years ago before I was director here and I was complaining about about the constraints that I felt with a particular piece of work we're doing at the time. He said, Matt, whenever you have a set of constraints or you are limited in the range necessarily because of space in this case or uh, some other reason, he said, consider it a discipline. Right? Think mm. about it not on the, the red side of the ledger but on the, on the black side. Think about how that discipline of trying to organise your thought around a set of ideas and being constrained actually might give you a sort of a precision and care for what you're saying as much as for what you're not. And I thought that was very good advice at the time and I suppose I've tried to remember that in my work here. It's, it's like a filter. It's essentially saying, okay, well, how, what, what is the best way by which you can bestow this information onto the audiences? Actually, you mentioned something just a moment ago that I think I wanted to ask you. How much in the decision-making that an organisation such as the NMA makes, or even you yourself directly, 
How much do you consider the audience? What I mean by this is, of course you do. We're here for the people and that's the idea. But I guess what I'm trying to get at is you can bait an audience to know more by giving them something that's topical or that they already know about. The other way is to open up things that they might not know about, but therefore the audience is much smaller because it's unfamiliar, yet it's probably a greater duty to do that. You see what I'm getting at? Yeah, here? I do. How, how much... How are you much, trying to do a bit of everything, Yeah, really? is it a bit of a mirror to what society understands and also a bit of an educational thing? It's a mixture of both, or is it... It is. Yeah. I, I think there's a, a deep truth in um, museum work uh, that really is connected to the ultimate success of places like this, like the National Museum. And that is that audiences want to feel both affirmed in what they know, but also challenged by what they don't. And when you get the mix of that sense that people are affirmed by what they are seeing or reading about or experiencing in a museum. But they're also taken into new territory and then they can use the, the store of knowledge that they have, that they have been affirmed uh, by seeing in some form that's recognisable in the museum, but they're taken into territory that actually challenges them. Then they can extend themselves mm-hmm. and they can really develop a new set of ideas. And it's so much better when they are making those connections themselves rather than seeing us as somehow didactically informing them yep, about things. Yeah. So that must mean that you think differently about the museum in the 21st century than we might have done even 50 years ago. That must mean that you think about these as participatory experiences, as as a kind of partnership that you have with audiences rather than them as simply consuming passively what you Um, provide or produce for them and when you do that i think you then hit a sweet spot in museums when people feel i know something about this but i'm taken to this territory and i'm going to make knowledge for myself in the experience of this visit to the museum that's a joy they're standing in the shoes in of those of us that are lucky enough to to work in these places Mm. they they are being curatorial themselves they're being intellectual themselves about what they're seeing but then making new knowledge and it's even better if they can contribute some of their own experience to whatever's happening in these places. And so that more dialogic sense of the contemporary museum, the idea that we're actually having a conversation, ongoing conversation yeah. with audiences, is really, I think, what lies at the heart of what we're trying to do and I think of the future of museums over this century. Because in my view, if we don't change, if we don't evolve, these institutions that have been so important to us Um, won't maintain or extend their relevance over the course of this century. We're going to see phenomenal change now in the fourth industrial revolution as digital technologies really become not just commonplace in our lives, but actually there's a a, a deep reciprocity that we're developing with these capabilities that we have that that take us into territory that we can't really even Mm. understand at the moment, AI, (laughs) automation of all kinds. And I think unless we develop this essential conversation with audiences, we will will lose our our hold, our our uh, place in the social life of the nation. And I think that'd be a great shame. I might be um really simplifying things here, and I wonder whether people in the industries I agree with me will say that's completely wrong, but that's fine. When I was working at the NGA, my biggest thing was around. Uh, starting a conversation. So it's not about people liking or disliking art. That's actually neither here nor there. It's about the fact that when they see something, they begin a conversation about it. It's a conversation starter. In fact, they always say that the best art is the ones that actually polarizes people and, you know, a debate begins. Whilst what I'm hearing about the museum, it's about having that conversation and, and actually taking it further. So it's starting and having, you know, it's almost, yeah, almost the way I, look, it's, it, I know that's very basic, but... No, no. Uh, look, I think, I think you know, there are conversations and they're conversations, aren't they? Um, you know, what I'm speaking about is a capacity to engage people in discussions, debates, even ruminations about ideas that, that give them some uh, sense of of their place in the world and then also what might be possible for them. And I I think about that a great deal in the work that we do here 
not in terms of just wanting aimlessly to have a, a set of conversations, but to have conversations of a kind people can't have elsewhere very often. And so I think it is true, for instance, that in the society we're living in now, the trustworthiness of sources of information that we once would have, you know, uh, accorded quite um, uh, simply and without uh, thought have been called into question. I think we're more questioning now the media. We're more uncertain about sources of information that we we uh, access online. Places like this are trusted sources of information, and then when they use that position of trust to establish these kinds of conversations and I think you insist on a basic respectfulness in the way those conversations then are taken up and proceed, and we do expect that. It's the only thing I really expect is that people are respectful of difference in a place like this. Uh, then I think you're doing something that the society needs and increasingly is become um, attenuated. You know, it's become very difficult sometimes to feel that you can have these kinds of open conversations about different issues that might to do with our past or our present experience, whatever they might be, and have them in ways that don't um, ultimately, ultimately sort of lead to a polarised debate and one in which people are confirmed in, with certainty about what they already know. I mean, what I'm interested in doing is taking people from what they know, as I said before, mm. and introducing them to another way of being and seeing, perhaps, that might encourage them to actually introduce some uncertainty into their lives in a productive way. Mm. You know, I'm very taken by this idea that there's not just one way generally to do things. There's many ways. And so we kid ourselves there's only one way of seeing the world our way. And increasingly, I think, sort of echo chamber of social media, you know, that's been much discussed, encourages us to find other people who think like us rather than being challenged by people that might think differently to us. And I'd love to think that's the role that places like this can still play in national life because I think we need it. Yeah. It almost sounds like on the one hand, essentially, the idea is by sharing a common knowledge of the past – and that being deeply understood essentially binds us together as, as the culture that is in society that is Australia. But at the same time, what it also does, it opens up a platform for us to have a much wider view that is by far more empathetic, uh, probably resilient to future changes, probably less divisive, or even the, me understanding that people have different forms of opinions and views, but essentially being able to have conversations around those rather than putting up walls. I'm hearing what you're saying is that the importance place of organisations such as the museum is essentially that, on the one hand, it binds us together with common knowledge, but then does allow us to have the ability to see other points of view and continue them without actually building walls and divisions and so on. It's it's a method by which communication and conversations can be had. It's That's the way that I'm seeing it. Yeah, look, I think that, I mean, we are at a certain moment when... Um the the common understanding, I suppose, of how the world works, what's important, you know, what isn't, is uh, is contested now at a very essential level. And what I mean by that is, when we all shared our sources of information broadly for the day's events, when we all broadly had a suite of newspapers that we might read, for instance. Yeah. We might have a different view of those events, but we probably didn't contest the idea that essentially the event that was being reported upon, whatever it might be, actually occurred and, and happened in some way. And then we would we would meet, we would exchange views about what that meant, then how we might regard what had happened in a particular way. But we didn't fundamentally question whether or not the event really took place. We're now it seems to me, arguing about conceptions of reality that can be wholly different. And at a, at a really basic level where the truthfulness of, of uh, daily experience might be questioned. Mm. So that, 
what you've seen, say, in, uh, in the United States, you know, but other parts of the world, it happens here in Australia as well, is people actually dispute what we would have once taken to be, um, a, you know, a, a, just a, an aspect of common knowledge. Um, we've seen this in the great existential debates about, you know, climate change, for instance, even about COVID, where people uh, were disputing the, the practical reality that these were events that we needed to deal with. Now, I understand people having different views of the science around climate change, but it seems to me undeniable that human-induced climate change is happening, and yet that was contested for a long time, and certainly in this country it's divided us um, politically and in other ways. Um, you know, similarly, those stories that emerged out of the United States of people who were denying the existence of the threat of COVID because they couldn't right see it. up to the moment <laughs> yeah. when they actually were consumed by it in hospitals. That was I found those appalling stories mm. to think that someone so denied something that was palpably real as to then ignore the concerns about how to protect themselves and be safe, you know, in the in the time of the pandemic. And only at the last moment, as they're drawing their last breath, were 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 understanding that this was a real thing that was happening to them, and that I think is dangerous. That we've we seem to have emerged in a moment now where we dispute the most commonly accepted things or things we should commonly accept, even if our views of what we should do about them might be wholly different. And I think that a place like this can actually insist upon. Uh, an opportunity that needs to be there for people to join debates about things we commonly accept, even when they might have different views of them. And that's something that we need. Yeah, so it's, it's a very fundamental principle of saying, look, here's the thing we can agree on. There's th Now, the, the interpretation of the historically and otherwise could be different, yeah. but yeah. we can all agree Correct. that is debate. Now, I, I really like that, and I can now understand why you were talking about the importance of institutions such as this one going into the next revolution, so to speak, and in the digital space, because, well, it's very easy to to copy things, things and make yeah. things that are real that are not, and essentially play with the ideas of history and so forth. So I can now actually appreciate where you were going with that. The change in the world of museums altogether, do you think the museums and galleries are, are ready for that change, or is it... <laughs> Well, we are here. <laughs> I can't speak for all of them, but I look. It's a it's a good question. So I I in um, recent years have chaired Icon Australia, which is the Australian arm of uh, the International Council of Museums, which globally is the largest uh, cultural heritage membership body that we have, and so there are lots of opportunities to discuss with my colleagues, you know, abroad. And uh, in, in pre-COVID times when I was travelling more and meeting with uh, directors of other museums, these subjects are constantly under discussion. Will all museums accept this challenge and will the practice of museums allow us to maintain relevance by 2100? I think it's an open question. Uh, I, I hope and pray that this museum is ready to accept those challenges and will change. But, of course, our history inclines us to that, really, in so many ways because it's relatively short. You know, we were founded by an Act of Parliament in 1980. This building was opened in 2001. We're still finding our way. And, and so the sense of change that might be necessary in a place like this is, I think, more easily embraced. That's not true necessarily of all museums and galleries around the world. And I think we will see... A, a, a great set of changes occur in the life of these places over the course of this century if they maintain their relevance, and if they don't, they'll fall by the way. Mm -hmm. And I think that would be sad because I think these great collections of the natural and cultural worlds, which is really what museums and galleries have done, whether it's art museums or a museum of... Australian history like this one or, you know, uh, the War Memorial or indeed any museum, the British Museum, that what they do is they say something reflexively about human experience and they say even when we're looking at the natural world, we're looking at it as through human eyes. We're trying to make sense of it through the natural sciences and 
to understand a set of our relations to the natural world and why it works the way it does and where we fit into that picture. And that's a very, very essential part of what it means to be grappling with the nature of experience and what 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 our place in the cosmos is you know mm. so i i don't want to have a, an overly sort of um sort of spiritual turn here in this <laughs> conversation but i i am affected by the sense that that these places do something important for us and that's why it's been so incredible to work here for well, it's, this it's long. It's more than a sense. I mean, we've just gone through why it is so profoundly important to have institutions where, like I said, the beginning of thought can be agreed on before debate starts. And, and I guess maybe my question around the fact that are we ready for the change that's going to come is one, because I think you use the word that will be sad if, it, if we don't get it yeah, right. Yeah, I think yeah. it's more than sad. It's, it's yeah. actually taking out a very fundamental and important component of what essentially binds us together into having our conversation in the first instance. Mm. Well, history so. t- tells us you don't always, you don't have to have museums. I mean, there are yeah, sure. times in human history we haven't really had anything that would approximate, you know, the contemporary yeah. museum. But I think we're better for it, mm. okay? And, uh, and so I think some real effort needs to be made to preserve this as a, as a you know, part of the character of, of our society, of our um, of our civil world, I suppose, and of the capacity that we have to join together. We we spoke a moment before about COVID or touched upon it, and I think what we learnt at the National Museum through the last two years has been, been particularly pertinent in terms of this discussion about mm-hmm. the meaning of museums. It was so affecting to see, and it has been so affecting to see, how people have really needed these places when they have felt a sense of threat. It was true of the bushfires too. You know, there was a remarkable Sunday here during the bushfires of 2019-20 when the museum remained open. Most of my colleagues had to close their their institutions because of the smoke. You might remember we were inundated with smoke here. And there was one day when when we were being affected by, but through good fortune and having a, a pretty good air conditioning system here and having a staff who believed it was important to try and stay open, it was a great credit to the people working that Sunday here. I came in and we had a discussion about saying, look, we think we should try and keep going today because people might need a place to come to when it's when it's this bad. And through the course of the day, a lot of people came who were effectively refugees from the south coast to Canberra. And this was one of the few places they could come to because it was still open in the course of the day. And to see how they were relieved to come in the door, how affected they were by their experiences. There were a lot of tears shed in the museum Mm. that day as people were trying to cope with what they'd fled from, you know, in the fire, uh, the fire ravaged areas. And I, I've talked to the staff about this since. I've never felt more clearly and obviously the role that these places can play to stitch people together when they need it most. And, you know, that's an extremist. That moment was a, a very um, atypical moment, a very unusual moment. But it was very affecting to see how much people needed the place um, precisely at that moment in their lives. How interesting. No, that's, that's an amazing story. We, we often get told in, in psychology, for example, that in moments of huge stress, we really throw away all the things that have been kind of passing in our lives and really focus on the things that are most important, which is why most people say family, etc. But um, that, that is really telling, I think, that people turned to the museum for that experience at a time which has essentially been exceptionally traumatic. It was interesting that it, there was a sense of it being refuge, right, after threat. But there was enough space to breathe in a way, and no pun intended given, the, you know, the, the circumstances. But there was a kind of a space where those people could, could gather themselves a bit. Now, okay, that's that's in, as I say, a moment of, of you know, ex- sort of their experience of extreme peril. But if that's true, then I think in other ways a museum is that safe space. It's a safe space for the practice of ideas 
and that's not something that I've invented. You know, a lot of people have talked about this, about how mm-hmm. museums are their safe spaces for dangerous ideas sometimes. And what they mean is that these are places where you can have the conversations you might not be able to have elsewhere. And that is germane to what we've just been talking about in terms of the conversations that we can and can't have in daily life now in the in the time of social media. So I do think there is, um, especially, I suppose, in what seems to be an increasingly secular world, that places like this take on a kind of a character of being safe spaces, places for negotiation uh, of security, the security of ideas that you can trust. It's a whole series of inflections on this, aren't there, once you start to look at it. I think it's also the case that, you know, when you look at the future and you think it's exceptionally uncertain, sometimes when you look at the past, it provides you with a bit of a surety because at least you know what's oh, happened. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's, that's... <laughs> what do you think? I'm a historian. <laughs> yeah. uh, well... <laughs> you know, I, I, I think that's a really... Um, that's a deep truth. Mm. And, and I, I suppose that what, what you see in... Um, in contemporary life, and I think a lot of us worry about a relative amnesia that we're developing about the fact that the past, you know, ever happened, is that you need a sense of where you've been to know where you might go, mm. right? Sure. And that's a pretty simple thing to say, but I think it is true, you know. And I, I, it's it's easy to convince yourself that the times you're living through are unparalleled, but it's not true. COVID, for instance. A lot of people said, oh, this is unprecedented. Well, no, sorry, it is precedented. And, and you know, within the past 100 years or so, we've had precisely this kind of experience and actually um, more uh, mordant and, uh, and uh, you know, destructive of, of people's lives and, uh, and of our societies and what we've experienced through COVID. Um, you know, the, the great... Um, Influenza epidemic just after World War One uh, took uh, you know many more lives um, in this country certainly and around the world in truth than we've seen so far um, through the COVID pandemic and that is not to diminish the loss we've suffered because of COVID it's just to be uh, honest about the fact that we we periodically confront these kinds of um, grave challenges and we can feel affirmed at some level by the fact that we've made it through those things, that we've somehow found a way to transcend those circumstances, however um, tragic and affecting the impacts of those conditions have been. That's true of now. You know, when this really rolled out and in fact, I remember when we closed the museum for the first time, which is something that was just I had never imagined I'd do as a museum director. It was actually thinking about those other moments when, when our society confronted similar threats that made me think, well, we'll get through this. You know, this is not so um, challenging so as to be uh, um, in, entirely destructive of human life and our conditions. And that is what the promise of the study of the past has for us, as well as a kind of a connection to human experience across the ages. You know, we've got this show, you know, Ancient Greeks, it's just coming to a close this weekend. It's been terrifically successful. It's very busy. That's why I'm late. (laughs) Yeah, it is. No, it's very, it's, uh, you're, you're, you know, um, entirely excused because it is very busy. But it's, um, it's a, it's a, it's a function of that show, I think, to be able to connect with the lives of people two and a half thousand years ago that are represented by some of the material culture from the ancient and classical Greek worlds. And there's both this connection about, in so many ways, human life being resembling the lives that we still have, the impulses of love, uh, delight, war, uh, even the way we have common experiences of wanting to go to the theatre and have dramatic performance, you know, up as a feature of how we we are entertained, but also you know, challenged by ideas. You can make that connection with people that lived two and a half thousand years ago in ancient Greece, and at the same time, the show says yes, but it is also different from mm-hmm. the life you're leading. So this this sense that we are part of a shared endeavour through the course of human life, I think, 
is what a place can do like this. But it doesn't mean that we're all the same. We're essentially different and diverse. And that's the truth of nation, is it's not one story, it's many stories. I'm loving this because I'm hoping that those who are kind of tuning into this conversation have or are getting a very clear picture of why this is so important. It's... It's, well, it's, me too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But, but I think... And reason, it's why it's worth doing. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. The reason that I said this, though, it's, you know, it's very... I could ask people, say, you know, why is art important? Mm. And people give you different answers. I, I think I just gave mine because it starts conversation. And, and, and also it's, it's a form of language. It's a form of communication that human beings have, and that's what makes us human, so, et cetera. What's interesting, I think museums are a little bit harder to pin down because people will say, well, it's historically relevant, but it's so much more than that. We're talking about the comfort, the sense of refuge, the safe space for conversation. I think they're really important points that you and I started exploring mm. over a coffee at your place, mm. which is what I wanted to bring to this. Before we finish up, we've got like maybe in the last, I don't know, seven minutes or so, I did want to kind of jump to you as a person. I, it did strike me, of course, that despite all this deep depth knowledge about history and the academic side that we discussed before, running an organization like this has or does mean you must have a very much a business sensibility about you too. I mean, there is staff, budgets, but there is shows, there is sponsors, there is stakeholders, the whole entire thing. It is ultimately a business too. Did that part of you come somewhat naturally or did you have to kind of develop that part to be able to manage, you know, the director, the business person versus the director, the, the historian, so to speak? Well, actually, part of the reason we've ended up talking about ideas today is I probably feel that that's the part of me that gets the, the kind of least attention in a way. And so it's a great opportunity for me to talk about the ideas that, that underpin why you're doing this work. But day to day, most of the work that I do is around the business of the museum. Yeah. And so the, whether it's a question of, the, of the, the way that we employ people, we've got about 250 staff here mm -hmm. at the National Museum, all doing very diverse things. One of the great things about a museum as, a, as an entity is the breadth of the skills uh, that are represented by the staff that you have, people who are scientists working, chemists working in our conservation areas, people working in the stores, uh, the registrars who look after the collection, maintain them and confine them, etc. The people that are researching the collections, you know, with a breadth of, of training across the humanities, not just history but geography, uh, anthropology, archaeology, archaeology and beyond. Uh, the people that are uh, the marketing team, uh, you know, in the museum, the media affairs people, the front of house team, the shop staff, you know, there's a breadth of skills. The people that run the building, you know, the facilities team. Of course. So they're an amazing amalgam of all these skills coming together to deliver this experience. Uh, it's part of the delight. That, yes, it is a business. And, you know, and, uh, and I've been lucky that... I've always had a sort of a head for numbers, and so the financial aspects of the museum, you have to be able to have some sense of, I think, when you're the CEO. You've got an excellent um, financial team here, but it's useful to be able to know where you, you sit. You know, this is – it's never been harder running these places, especially in, mm. you know, time of COVID, because uh, as well as the very – um, great appropriation we received from government. We've got to raise money as well through commercial activity on the site. And so that's been harder to do when we haven't had audiences in the place because of COVID. So there's a lot to, to these places. Um, I've, I, I'm interested in both sides, I suppose, okay. of that. And I, I always have been quite fascinated by the business of the museum and uh, as well as being someone inclined to history and the, and the world of ideas. Uh, I don't know how that comes to be, really. You know, I had a very, um, you know, sort of straightforward uh, upbringing. I was a child of, of a Italian migrants, effectively. Well, my mother had been born in Australia, but both her parents were Italian from the same village as my father. I grew up on a poultry farm in Perth. Um, it was a very outdoors life, and I still, you know, of course, that I, you know, I live on a property outside mm. Canberra, which is obviously sort of harkens to that of experience I had as a, as a child. I grew up as the youngest of of um, four kids. I've got three fantastic older sisters who have been very good to me through the course of my life. I've got a fantastic wife who really enables so much of everything that we do, you know, and uh, and great kids, you know, really as a result of her more than me. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I've been lucky, you know, I really count myself very fortunate. And one of the great fortunes was to grow up you know, in Australia, in Perth, and then to, you know, move to Canberra as an adult. And, um, and I think 
you know, one of the experiences of being the child of migrants is that you probably don't take it for granted in any way and the fortune that you've had, um, but and you're also trying to make some some sense of what part of sort of home and host country is determining your experience. And before we started this conversation, you and I were remarking on our sort of relative experiences yeah. as, as migrants or as children, of, you know, as a child of migrants. And I think there is something that is very strong about the experience of coming out of a recent migrant um, uh, condition. And you... You are part of Australian society, but you have some capacity to draw back from it and actually try and understand it as well. And you're negotiating, in a way, what it means to live in this country, and it's more active and conscious than it might be otherwise. Now, there's some downsides to that, and Australia has had its own challenges in the way at times that it's welcomed people. But by and large, mm. a lot of people have found their home here and it's been done pretty well. We haven't had great civil unrest. Occasionally we've had flares of it, but largely our history is one of doing it successfully, amalgamating all these people from around the world together with this extraordinary history of First Nations people in this country and finding a way. Not always perfectly. We've got great challenges still ahead, it seems to me, about reconciling properly this long human history of place and the, and the place of the First Nations people in the in the nation. Mm. There's much still to do, but we find a way ultimately. We're quite pragmatic. I think pragmatism is a great feature of Australian life, and uh, and I think I was lucky in the particular experience I had growing up as uh, the youngest kid in a, a migrant family. To, to have the support and security and the, the encouragement to education that comes very often in migrant experiences, uh, but at the same time a kind of delight in Australian life and culture that I was finding my way in, and my sisters found their way in as well, uh, that, that was sort of integrative, you know, that took us into the life of, you know, this land. And I find it, I suppose, in many ways astonishing that that as I got older, you know, my wife and I were inclined to move to, to a, a property um, outside Canberra that sort of approximates mm. the condition that I grew up in and actually, as it happens, she did, you know, in outside Melbourne, yeah. you know, down on the Mornington Peninsula. And there's something about the circularity of life, I think, in that that I find quite affirming. I'm hearing too that maybe one of the reasons you end up doing what you've been doing is you have, and you mentioned this a moment ago, an academic insight coupled with pragmatism. That's where the business yeah. comes from. Maybe. Um, and, and, and if you combine those two qualities and, and keep growing on them, you eventually end up to the skill set that's kind of required to be able to do what you do here. Maybe. I, I, you know, it's interesting. I mean, I think I said before about my um, disinclination to any kind of intellectual snobbery, mm. and I really mean that. You know, I, I, um, I'm very ordinary. You know, like I have very middle brow, I reckon, is the way I, I talk about this, is that I... I just think um, I'm, I can be simply delighted by a lot of things that seem very banal, okay? And that I, 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 when I was younger, I probably worried that somehow I wasn't as clever or as intellectually inspired as, uh, as other people that I might have come across in the course of my studies. Mm. And, um, and, but as I've aged, I've actually been grateful for it, that in a way I love farm work. And I, I love the experience of being outdoors and done a lot of walking and, um, and I played a lot of sport, I suppose, you know, particularly when I was younger. My kids play a lot of sport now. I just, I just, uh, I think that for all the, the conviction I have about a thinking life and the enlargement of the self that comes from it, mm. I think that there's a deeply embodied sense of what it means to be human that means that we have to relate to the world, to, others, to, yeah. to, to landscape, to, to environment, yeah. and find our way physically in the world as well. And that's what, that's what the 
the peculiar amalgam of of the human condition sort of is in so many ways. And if you if you overdo one to the exclusion of the other, I think ultimately it it, it can it can be. Um, I mean, maybe I'm making a judgment there, but it seems to me to be diminishing of the potentiality of the self. You know, mm. it's it's as fabulous going on a bike ride as it is, you know, yeah. reading a new work of Australian history, and those things are, are both what make you human. Yeah, that, that's lovely. And actually, I, I think a way we could put it is that if a museum has to be relevant to the people, has to be for the people, um, it has to have a director that is of the people as well. Yeah, well, very first right. of all, if you were an elite in your thinking, you'd lose touch with what it is that the institution is trying to do and probably the people that it's trying to do it for. So I think in that respect, your approach to all of this, being able to have an intellectual conversation, but essentially being a very relatable person is exactly what the nature or the quality or the personality of the museum really is. Well, it has look, to be welcome to everyone. Others might have to decide that, not me, actually. Yeah, of but, and I, <laughs> look, I do think this, that, that places like this, they draw from the people that, that lead them, in fact, from anyone that works here, you know, what they have to give. Mm. And so, you know, whoever, you know, I'm coming to the end of my second term mm. and it means that the museum in a couple of years will have a new director. What, whoever that person is, you know, they'll give what they have to give to the life of this place and it's the accretion of all that experience that makes the museum okay I, I you know I, I you don't expect to have the same people leading these places and so maybe it needs you know a wholly devoted intellectual person sure. that leads it in the next time or maybe it needs someone who is so pragmatic as to be disinclined to you know to the grandiosity of ideas <laughs> i don't know you know but whatever happens yeah. that'll be the thing it might need right yeah. and I, I do have i don't know whether that's fatalism of a kind but i i do think you give the things that you can give to places and it's always partial right um i uh I, you know i think there's lots of ways of being right in the world all of them work all of them make some sense you know, I, I've just described what what I've had mm. and what I, you know, what I've hoped I've been able to sort of give to the life of of this place in some small way. But it's not it's not you know one size fits all. You know, it, it you have to you have to have a mix of things in this place. And thank God, you know, this isn't about this isn't about the director of the National Museum. It's about this community of people that work here, but then all the people that come through the doors that colour the, the the character of the place. That's what determines the place, really, audience, right? And in, and then in the in this conversation we're having with the audience, you get the form of work that we do. So I think it's so complicated um, and, it, and it relies on so many different moving parts as to be a wonder, really. And I hope in the course of this conversation, I give them some sense of what it's been like to have been lucky enough to work within that wonder, you know, to be a part of it um, for this time. And, you know, in a personal sense, but by the time he sort of finishes as director, I'll just, I'll be grateful for it, extremely grateful for it. But, you know, you, you'll you move on to the next part of your life, I hope. You know, I, um, I have a real... <laughs> A, a previous director once said to me, he said, you know, Matt, that nothing is so X as an X director and, <laughs> um, and I thought he was very wise when he said it to me uh, in his way and, um, and I really think that. So, you know, it's a good thing not to sort of darken the halls of the institution once you've left. You know, you, you move on, you do something else, you find... You know, the delight, I don't know, in my case it might be, you know, making olive oil or oh, for sure. making some wine on the property rather than, than working here. But yeah. I think that's just what happens. Yeah, well, um, um, we'll be tuning in to see what happens in a couple of years' time. And I'm, <laughs> and I'm sure whoever the next director will be, considering this is a historical institution, we'll be looking at its history and the best aspect of what's happened and building on them because that's what that's all about, even if they change direction a little bit. Well, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I hope I've honoured the previous directors here. You know, yeah, some great people yeah. have been 
preceded me in this job and uh, you feel a great responsibility to them as well as to the staff. Indeed. Um, Matt, thank you so much. I, I know I've probably taken more time than I should have um, and that's all because I got stuck in the ticket queue for what is a very busy <laughs> exhibition but I managed to get no, here. Good on you. So thank you. It's been wonderful speaking to you. We could, we could keep going forever but I know you've got things to get to. So once again, it's been a huge pleasure. No, and thank you, Ashley. I've enjoyed it. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Dr. Matthew Trinker from the National Museum of Australia here on Behind the Bio. I certainly did. And if you think others would enjoy it, then please let them know. And if you'd like to get in touch with me with any thoughts, then I'll really welcome it as well. Ashley underscore Farod at Outlook.com. You can get me there by email. Or if you prefer Instagram, then at Behind the Bio podcast and we can chat there. I'd like to thank the Coordinate Group once again for making all of this possible and I hope I can catch you at the next episode of Behind the Bio.